Okay. Hi okay. there. Uh, hello and welcome to Biotensegra Tea Party Season 2, Episode 8. Today we have guest speaker Eleftherios Pavlides coming to us from Providence, Rhode Island. He'll be talking about his work at Roger Williams University and with his Pavlides Elastegrity and how it augments the theory of biotensegrity. So, um, Eleftherios, a quick wave from you if we could, and we'll come back to you in a second for the toast. My name is Susan Lowell de Solorsano, and I'm coming to you from the last United States colony of Washington, D.C., which is very warm today, up in the 80s. And I'm Graham Scar from Nottingham in the UK, not quite as warm. <laughs> and I'm Chris Clancy from just outside of Vancouver in Deep Cove. So this is the Biotensegra Tea Party and it's our intention here to promote and share the Biotensegrity concept with as many people as possible and to include all of you in that mission. The Biotensegra Tea Party is an all volunteer production of the Stephen M. Levin Biotensegrity Archive, a not-for-profit organization whose mission is to educate raise public awareness and build community in the field of biotensegrity and to foster and forward discovery, research and understanding in the fields of science, health and medicine. Thanks, Chris. We're gonna take a second to introduce our wonderful volunteer team. Today we have uh, Lisa Babiak from St. Albert, Alberta, Canada. How are you, Lisa? Hi, Lisa. She's got her camera off. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> Gregory Schutte from Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Hey, Gregory. Hi, Gregory. And Patricia Hopper from Seattle, Washington. Hi, Patricia. Patricia. And we want to give a big thank you to our volunteer from last week, Mariana Barreto, who is also um, hosting the show and who very convincingly played the role of that guy, the sort of newbie to biotensegrity who is encountering a lot of confusion and has a lot of misunderstandings. She played her role so well that we had people writing to her saying, oh, no, no, it's easy. You need to understand this. So she was completely convincing. But we want you to know that she's really um, in my estimation, she's just one of a handful of people who has a really great understanding of uh, biotensegrity. So thank you, Mariana. And now we're going to have, um, and Mariana is not here today, so don't look for her. Yeah, so <laughs> let's begin. We're going to ask um, Lefteri, uh, we can talk about all the different versions of your name, I guess, later, but perhaps you could give us an opening toast. Okay. Um First of all, thank you very much for inviting me to talk to you, but uh, it's a treat. And um, last time I was with this group was in 2015 and, and, and it was magnificent. So to health, Stia. Yeah. And yeah. To, 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 to the end of the pandemic, and I don't mean COVID-19, I mean the lethal pandemic of fossil fuels. <laughs> Maybe they're over with it by the end of the decade. Yes. Yeah. Well, I am. That's wonderful. I think um, we're going to go over to Graham before um, Left There he starts his presentation and hear about our sponsors. Thank you, Susan. Our Biotensegrity Party is an all volunteer production of the Stephen M. Levin Biotensegrity Archive and made possible through the generous support of our sponsors. Handspring Publishing in East Lothian, Scotland, have a wide range of authors and books available for movement and manual therapy professionals, and are offering a generous discount coupon to those on the Biotensegrity Archive mailing list. They also produce a free regular newsletter, which you can join from their website, and provide details of their webinar series with Elizabeth Larkin. Next, we have Embodied Biotensegrity with Chris Clancy in Vancouver, British Columbia who provide an excellent resource for those of you looking to learn more about biotensegrity. 
Chris is currently offering a 14 day free trial for her ongoing course, Biotensegrity Trailblazers. So check out the chat box on Zoom for more information. Artifact Pro in Madrid, Spain, where you can find wonderfully constructed Tensegrity models and to offer a generous discount coupon to our Zoom participants. Matrix Repatterning with George Roth, who runs courses and will be our guest speaker at next week's Biotensegrity party. Integrated Biotensegrity in Alberta, Canada with Lisa Babiuk, who also runs regular courses and supports the tea parties. The Biotensegrity Congress coming from Brazil, who are running a series of workshops for movement teachers and manual therapy professionals in both Portuguese and English, will be between April 23rd to 25th. And I believe the lost discount code from last week has uh, reappeared and we'll put it in the chat box again. From the fasciahub.com, we're organizing a full day event entitled The Fascial Foot on Saturday 8th of May with speakers John Sharkey, Wilbur Kelsick, Elizabeth Larkham and Philip Beach. Plus a somatic experiencing session with innovative movement teacher Rachel Tudor, who will take you into engaging with your own feet and lead to a deeper awareness that informs both your practice and self-care. Early bird tickets are £35 and currently available until the 5th of April. And lastly, but not least, is Pretensed in Holland with Gerald de Jong, who now have a range of different tensegrities for sale and currently offering a whopping 50 euro discount on their six twist essentials model, of which there are only seven left, I'm informed. informed. You can find more details about all our sponsors on the Zoom chat. Thank you, and back to you. Hey, thanks, Graham. If you're wondering what those um, pretensed um, arches by Gerald Jong uh, look like, you can look at the earlier tea party from this season uh, where he was doing some amazing demonstrations. And uh, Rachel Tudor, of course, is often a volunteer for us, has done so much work for us. So always happy to hear her name coming up. And isn't it amazing that a year and a half ago, there were so few things to go to, attend, look for, if you were interested in all of this. And now there are so many, I'm just completely delighted. Um, so let's get over to you, Lefteri. So your name is Eleftherios. That is the formal version of your name. Is that right? I just want to get this part right. Yes, yes. Eleftherios Pavlidis and Lefteri for short. That's and, perfect. Uh, shall I share the screen at some point? Yes, but I first want you yes. to um, tell everybody your story about the olives. So I, so I want you to all know, I, let, I met uh, Lefteri in 2015, but of course I had heard about him so many years prior uh, in working with Steve because they just go back so far and you guys would go to that um what is the buckminster fuller focused conference that you would have up there every year and joe clinton was always part of steve would go up to those uh, yes they, they they have um RISD has a conference every two years ah it's at RISD every two years yeah so of course I knew your name well before I met you and it's just been great to reconnect again. And uh, when we spoke yesterday, I was asking about sort of how you got started on this path. And I know you're gonna talk about that a little bit, but you've got to tell everybody this great story about your olives. I don't know how I got into the second grade uh, reminiscent, but that's when I was exposed to close packing of spheres uh, for the first time. It was uh, being in Greece um, they showed us a jar of olives, and um, and uh, they were big, beautiful Greek olives. And they told us to to guess how many there were in there. And um, and um, I I cheated. I counted how many I could see in the bottom, and then multiplied with the layers. And um, the the first person to to guess was twenty four. Uh, the most popular kid, and then everybody else, a uh, similar number, but five, uh, six times six is 36. And that's the number I gave. 
And uh, by good luck, I could never have gotten it through measuring because olives are not uh, spheres. Uh, I got it on the nose. That was my first um, anything I earned with my wits. So you <laughs> love that story and you gave it a big moral dimensions, which I never thought of. But uh, you're right. I can I can use that. But it shows that instead of just copying the number close to the popular kids number, you actually said, wait a minute, let me see if I can figure this thing out and get a little closer. And you, it just shows original thinking in my mind. So I'm really. Yeah, well, sure. second graders tend to be very original <laughs> across the board. <laughs> and some um, survive it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I also wanted to mention, you have this, um, you have this creature that you've uh, come up with, and I first knew it as the elastegrity, and now it's called the Pablides elastegrity. And what I want people to know is that that wasn't you deciding to brand it with your name. It was actually a mathematics person or an editor. Yeah, an editor from England, and there were several reasons for that. That's that has its own story. It went through many names. The first time I named it Tense Segrity, and then I communicated with Snelson, and he said it's not in pure tension. He was very accurate, and, and part of his criticism of Buckminster Fuller was that he kept calling everything Tense Segrities, including things that have moment connections, and they are not in pure tension. So after that, uh, I called it Elastegrity, for a while, I called it membrane elastegrity, then icosahedral, but the editor pointed out that it's only fleetingly icosahedral. As you will see in the presentation, it changes shape and becomes many different things. Yes. And, and he said that architects who invent things like Hoberman, it's mm -hmm. named after them, Hoberman sphere. Yes. And, and then he argued that um, that uh, the, Ru the Rub Rubik was uh, also an architect. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's he a Rubik cube. So uh, Pavlidis Elastegrity, I said, okay, that is going to be. It solved many problems because at one point I called it with four words, Kyra like Osahidral hinge Elastegrity. <laughs> anyway, so that's the story of the naming. Thank you. Okay, well, why don't we um, get your screen share going um, and get to your presentation because I'm quite excited. Um, if you do have questions, you can put them in the chat. I'm going to try to keep a peek at those. If they are questions that really have to do with all of us better understanding something about the presentation, then I may uh, jump in and interrupt because uh, Left There has told us, go ahead, interrupt me. It's very easy and relaxed that way, which I appreciate. Um, however, if, um, if it's something that can maybe wait to the end, we'll, we'll do that because I think we've got a lot of territory to cover here. Okay, take it away, Left Dairy. Okay, so uh, augmenting the tensegrity conjecture, elastegrity hinges and mobility. Uh, special thanks to Steve, uh, who I will reference throughout because he gave a lot of ideas that, um, frankly, I couldn't understand where they were coming from. Uh, but the elastegrity gave them meaning. And also the elastegrity answered some of the quibbles that some people, I went to biotech sangrity, I mean, to mechanobiology conferences. And um, uh, tensegrity is not uh, viewed, um, they're very critical. And, uh, and um, in my presentation, I address to some of the quibbles. I will point that out. And of course, Susan Graham and Chris, thank you so much. And at the bottom, these are my, collab my collaborators. Um, uh, Zhao is an engineer, Matt is a biologist. The others are students of mine. And NASA has been giving me small amounts of money. I should mention, if any of you are associated with the university or have a technical degree or medicine, I would appreciate um, uh, if you send me your name uh, so I can cite you as people 
uh, that um, heard the presentation. I have to prove that I'm disseminating and uh, with COVID, I haven't been traveling too much. Okay, so we can do that. I'm sorry? Can we make sure we put um, uh, Left Aries, um email address in the chat as well? Uh, because I know that universities are pressing for that. And so we will make sure people do that. Thank you. Yeah, it might help me get the next one. You know, $10,000 right. for a graduate student for summer work, it goes a long way. So a lot of what you see uh, comes from that. Um, so the story starts um, at the Yale School of Architecture. And um, I, I have here, which was the, the spirit of the Bauhaus was at the Schools of Architecture at that time. And um, here's my professor, Ken Bloomer, who, um, who the first thing he told us, we are architects of students eager to design buildings. And he wanted to teach us that um, form doesn't come arbitrarily. You have to figure out the basic rules. And then like knitting, knitting, I don't know if any of you knit, you put the thread over or under, there's nothing else you can do. So you get an infinite uh, number of patterns. So he said the form in nature, but also in architecture is the same way. Um, and he said, uh, so he gave two assignments. The one assignment is to, he introduced the concept of closed packing spheres that you are probably familiar, the closest way of parking spheres, there are two, the, the so-called AB that creates a linear stack or the ABC where the, the, the crystal grows around a center. And um, I had a talk with Susan yesterday and she said, well, yeah, but you have little gaps. The way to understand closed parking is to look here. You can see my cursor, right? When I'm pointing. Yes, yes, we can. Okay, so if you join the centers of, uh, of the spheres, you get tetrahedra and octahedra. And the tetrahedra and octahedra together um, close pack. That's the Kepler theorem, which was not proven until actually 10 years ago. And um, that was the one exercise, neat take the tetrahedra and octahedra with applicator sticks and make space. The other exercise, and he also to, close, to introduce close packing, he told us um, how many uh, cookies can you put in, 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 in the pan, uh, in the oven. And when you stagger them hexagonally, um, you, um, you, that's when you get the most. And if you think that is uh, the diameter of spheres, then you can stack the second layer in three of the six holes. And if you use the same, same holes, then you get the AB. But if you go back and forth, you will get the ABC. The other exercise was from Albers. That was one of the reasons my editor insisted, I call it Pavlidis, because what you see here is uh, a 1918 um, um, exercise um, which um, engineers uh, in 1970 appropriated it and they named it after the engineer who used it, not the person who invented it. And um, so in a way, uh, making sure that things that come out of art are not devalued, um, science and uh, engineering, um, they are um, they they don't recognize the um, the contribution of art to innovation. That's a separate lecture. You, you can call me back for that. And, uh, <laughs> Left there, I'm going to interrupt for a second. So yeah. that's um, Albers, who was then uh, after Bauhaus closed, went to Black Mountain College. Yes. Is that the same? Yes. Yeah. He's the same guy, and then he was at various places, including uh, at Yale and, and other places. At, at Yale, he ran the graphics department. Uh, many people know him uh, for uh, the paintings, uh, but um, Albers was um, uh, also, uh, had actually, uh, paper was only one of the many materials that they asked uh, the, paper, the material, what do you want to be? The way that Louis Kahn says, Brick, what do you want to be? And Brick said, I like an arch. Well, I asked paper, what do you want to be? 
and paper told me I like an octahedron. <laughs> so I'm going to say, so, so um, Albers and his wife, Annie, were both at uh, Black Mountain College when um, Kenneth Snelson was there and met Buckminster Fuller in the summers of um, 1948 and 1949. And Annie taught weaving. So I love that you're talking about weaving and knitting and crochet and it's, it's wonderful. We know that Snelson said that weaving is the mother of tensegrity. So I love this, thank you. Yeah, sure, sure. There's a lot of that coming. Anyway, so here you love that too, uh, Susan, the dactylognosis. That's a word I made up and I Googled it and nobody had done it. I tried other to make up other words, like elastegrity was already in, uh, in uh, a sculptor, uh, did tensegrities, but instead of putting cables in tension, he put piano wires. And a few months before me, he had already come up with the word elastegrity. Um, so, but dactylognosis, learning, having revela revelatory learning through, through, um, through finger exploration, dactyl. And you can see here the um, God's finger uh, giving birth to life. Um, and uh, so here you see, once I made the paper, the paper diamond, you can see here. Um, I, I, and by the way, there were at least um, another six people that I know of that invented it independently. There was a guy in England who wrote a, a book uh, on origami mathematics, and um, he lists uh, all of these guys. One was in the 60s, but by, they all named it different things. Skeletal octahedron, uh, he named it. Uh, I named it diamond, paper, uh, paper diamond. And, but di uh, diamonds are crystals, so they need to grow. So this is various ways I use to e explore how to grow the crystal, especially knowing it can be grown as A, B, and A, B, C. And, um, and in one failed experiment, this is um, one of the ways of linking them. And this is the, the, the two squares that I had made to make the link, and then I, I put a, a tear in the center just to, because I could. It's like in nature, if something can happen, it happens. And then I realized you can make little squares, little crosses. And uh, since this was um, weaving of, um, of uh, squares, I thought, why not weaving of crosses? So I ended up with this flabby um, structure. It wouldn't stay together, so I threw it out. And then accidentally I did it again. And then I said, oh no, I've done that before, but not to waste, you know, I just stuck my finger a bit in the crevice and flipped it inside out. And that's how the elastegrity came about. Um, oops, nope, how do I go? Okay, so, uh, so that's how it, uh, it was created. You can see it right here. And um, so elastegrity, uh, could be, this is a, the sculpture with the piano wires. These are hinge elastegrities and these are nodal elastegrities. This is Ingber's, we'll talk more about it later, model of the cytoskeleton. And um, as, so you can see these are tensegrities and there is a correspondence. So this the elastegrity, they have the same symmetry. Uh, this is a 12 strut. This is a 12 strut, but this also has the same 12 strut uh, geometry through further folding. Um, and one of the reasons that it's not icosahedral and, um, and um, etc. So elastegrity, integrity of shape through elasticity, islands of rigidity in the sea of elasticity or pre-stress. That metaphor actually was used by Buckminster Fuller or at least that's what Edmundson says um, uh, in her book, Interpreting, because if you read Fuller himself, sometimes it doesn't come across. You all know the um, Fuller explanation, the book by Edmundson. So similarities, um, negative Poisson ratio, which is a synonym for oxetic, and we'll talk about it, 
because I think that's a very important idea. Um, and also it becomes evidence um, of tensegrity in, in biological structure or the more broad term elastegrity because tensegrity has been, can be seen as a special case of, uh, of the more broad elastegrity. Uh, identical um, icosahedral symmetry, at least in that state, shape resilience, when you deform them, when you let go, they come back to the original form and that's why the name. Now that's a big idea. Reaction to form is from the entire deformation of the structure. That's one of the reasons that Steve gives uh, why we can lift much bigger loads and uh, the Borelli um, mechanics are being proven wrong every four years at the Olympics. And uh, energy is transmitted through elastic hinges or the pre-stress. That explains a mechanotransduction in the cytoskeleton. And, um, and uh, so they, anything that uh, all the, at least in the literature, what uh, has been called um, um, as properties of the tensegrity uh, the Pavlidis elastegrity um, has um, can uh, can accommodate uh, and and, uh, and 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 pr provide um, um, what's needed to explain uh, to model um, biological form. Now differences: one obviously is made with hinges; the other is uh, nodes. Um, one has simple a, a simple assembly; the other is complex. It needs scaffolding and it's uh, great artistic skills. Shape shifts through further folding, does not shape shift. You need directional actuation. That's one of the cool, um, can you see me? Do I hold it in the right place? When I just press in one axis and the whole thing rotates and moves uh, cooperatively. Like a jitterbug. A jitterbug goes in both directions. So it's wrong to call that jitterbug because the symmetry is critical for the name jitterbug. Okay, so this only goes in one direction. Yes, it's chiral. Oh, I see, unidirectional actuation. Yes, and and uh, and that's actually one of the things that Bachman is a fully wrote down and it's wrong. He said uh, symmetry, uh, nature is symmetrical. <laughs> Obviously it's chiral biological structure. So uh, Fuller was very loose with the words, but some of the things he did were very important, but you'd have to edit out some of the noise that was created in the process. Um, limited degree of freedom, that's very important as you'll see a little later, while uh, the big degree of freedom um, means that if you put pressure on it, it can go in all different directions. And they both have negative Poisson ratio, but one has minus one. It means it can move equally. Um, we'll talk about that in a minute. And the other has very, very slight negative Poisson ratio. I'll define what negative Poisson ratio is right now. So here it is. So for those of you familiar, I'm not sure if you're all familiar with this. If you pull something, most of them, they get narrower. An oxetic material, when you pull it, it gets fatter. Now, when it was not reported in the New York Times for the first time, they called it perverse. And in the literature, they still see it as uh, unexpected, weird. Um, but in fact, oxeticity um, uh, gives uh, special properties and, and uh, in boost performance. So, um, it's it's uh, actually it gives a mechanical advantage, um, and and it should not be. Um, I, I actually I recently presented at a mechanobiology conference arguing that it's possible it's totally ubiquitous or at least if it's not ubiquitous it's it's a lot more prevalent uh, in in uh, biological structure, and in that sense it's analogous to I don't know if you're familiar with Taleb the guy from. Um, Black Swan, he, he, he is yeah, an economist. The anti-fragility theory, yeah. yes, we In are. In economics, he actually says it's anti-fragility is very biological. I don't know if he knows exactly what it means, but it's true that uh, 
resilience resists and thy fragility gets stronger. So one thing that's very clear is like um, the artery, uh, when it gets wider diameter, it gets thicker. So it gets stronger to, to, um, to resist the pulsing, the increased pressure of the pulsing blood. Okay, so um, one of the first people to discover uh, negative Poisson ratio uh, was in cow teeth. Uh, so they warned that um, we should not assume in, in biology that it has positive Poisson ratio. The presumption was that it contains water and they're therefore incompressible. So Poisson ratio, um, uh, but they say it's not tenable um, to be uh, 0.5 like rubber and, um, or, uh, or even positive. Um, this warning was not heeded for a good reason. This is 1991. Uh, the reason is that it's extremely hard to measure things in biology and, and um, especially uh, Poisson's ratio. And um, I reviewed uh, uh, a few dozen articles that found negative Poisson ratio. And first, Poisson ratio differs according to direction. So Poisson ratio is the lateral um, e expansion as a result of, of, of uh, pulling or pushing. So if you pull and gets fatter, um, the, that does not happen in all the orientations. When you have a lateral, you have a plane with many different directions. So the Poisson ratio in anisotropic, that's the term. And it's a term that um, was also introduced by Steve uh, for me. And uh, life is anisotropic and, um, and therefore um, um, you cannot measure in one direction you have to do in many different directions. The second thing is this time hysteresis. That means it changes over time, like wood. Um, when you first push on it, you get a positive uh, uh, Poisson ratio. But if you wait 24 hours and the force ripples through the structs or its various uh, scales, uh, you end up with negative Poisson ratio. So it's the direction and also the time and even the method of clumbing for the uh, pig skin uh, will affect uh, outcomes. And um, even the stress level, uh, at low stress levels, it's negative, but if you keep pulling and it's still elastic, but it becomes, um, it becomes uh, positive. So DNA, if you pull it, initially it overstretches, but if you keep pulling, it gets thinner. And uh, okay, so these are all the, uh, the articles. You see organic molecules. Uh, by the way, I have uh, all the, the links to all these papers. And since I did that, I found um, almost as many. Uh, so this is not exhaustive. This is kind of uh, um, by uh, chance and convenience. Um, so at the, level, uh, at the molecular level, so you have um, organic uh, uh, acids, lactic acid, uh, you have uh, DNA, RNA, um, then you have uh, cells, the embryonic, embryonic stem cells and, and components of cells like chromatin and my, my oh, fabric, I cannot read it. Um, okay, organs. Uh, so it's like uh, people from, um, um, yoga um, are very aware of the lungs becoming taller and wider at the same time. The same thing with the pulsing of the heart. But from the, um, and these are all chronologically arranged. So skin um, and for, uh, for, from cats to cow, to salamanders, uh, spider silk, arteria, endothelium, we were just talking about it. Now, Engineered, so there are many engineered, uh, not many, so there are six families of engineered um, um, lattices. Uh, they are called metamaterials. And engineered metamaterials um, have uh, superior properties. Um, and, and, and that's a hint that uh, if they have superior properties, 
um, then biology would have found them and, and it did. Um, so um, vibration damping, fracture toughness, shock impact, low velocity and shear resistance, energy absorption, sound absorption. For example, a bullet impact densifies oxetic Kevlar to help stop it. Here you can see the negative Poisson ratio of the six strat. Uh, that's an experiment that you might have done at home. You can see how when the two sticks are pulled together, they, everything comes together from all directions. And when you pull, it, it opens up. And um, here you can see the elastegrity that it has, as I said, minus one. So you can tune it to have anything you want. You can have it positive or negative, depending on the direction. And uh, here you can see it when it's not moving, how it gets thinner um, when it's shorter and fatter when it's taller. Okay, so I'm going to talk about um, eight, um, eight um, aspects, some of them um, confirming what integrity uh, is doing and some improving, uh, improving in terms of answering the quibbles that some critics have, have, uh, have le uh, leveraged. And, and uh, synchronized pulsing, um, the, 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 the idea of a kinetic stability. Now, it's interesting because when I first met Steve, at the, actually it was at, at the RISD, no, it was not a conference, it was, he was giving a special lecture. We had um, dinner together. So I gave him a gift of um, elastegrity and he said, oh, that explains why the head does not wobble on top of the spine. Um, of course, this is not a synovial uh, hinge like the body has, but um, it's a, a hinge uh, has allows for bigger control. And uh, interestingly enough, uh, Donald Dinberg, um, two years ago, published this, um, um, this um, um, dynams, they are uh, the machinery of, uh, of, uh, of the single cell. And, and he made this model, uh, but in order to, he, he introduced the hinge. So it's not a pure nodal tensegrity, but it has a hinge for the same reason, to reduce the degree of freedom. And uh, these are his own words. Uh, and, and to focus the effect on the introduction of energy. So, um, so independently, the idea of the hinge as being a, a modification that improves, um, improves predictability as a model. And here um, you see, um, we just did this summer, you know, that was the NASA money. We were able to make physical models as well as uh, this digital model. I was telling Susan that in order to solve the problem, once you see it, it's simple, but uh, it was complicated, uh, but the physical model allowed us to solve the problem. And then once the fingers did all the discovery, then the digital model uh, was possible. And uh, the shock absorption is, um, is one of the arguments that uh, Steve does about um, the being able to, to lift uh, much bigger loads than uh, anticipated by current um, um, Lever, lever theory. The other thing um, that uh, Steve actually had introduced, um, he kept talking about non-Newtonian fluids and, and, and I could never understand why. And he said, well, it has to do with the power curve. So it was a very abstract idea, but uh, the elastegrity uh, as a physical model, you can see here, there are three volumes here you see down here, volume total is the yellow, the orange, and the green. So there are three. Uh, so these are the volumes that change uh, according to the angle. You see 0, 15. That's the dihedral angle of the hinge. So it expands uh, here. And uh, so if you graph the volume that's here, that's actually from, from uh, uh, Steve's... Um, um, presentation 
where he has this graph. It's an abstract. He says heart, alveoli, bladder, uh, uterus, kidney, muscle, uh, uh, says uh, load uh, and extension strain. That means uh, displacement and force, which um, this is my collaborator who took an uh, Pavlidis elastegrity and, and, and put it and put it in very careful, that's at MIT with very good equipment, was able to make this beautiful curve. And he even uh, got the equation for it, but there was no space on the slide to put it in. It's really wonderful. Yeah, it's not interesting, all these things. And, um, and you know, that was my side, uh, my sidekick. I, I, my full-time job uh, wouldn't allow me to. So now it's, it's really, I'm splurging. That's all I do. I betrayed architecture and ran away. I lopped with, with my first love was mathematics when I was in high school. <laughs> anyway, so- maybe, maybe in second grade. <laughs> it hadn't started in second grade. I guess that was the first thinkling. Yeah. But uh, during, um, during, you know, the years that, um, you know, you do marijuana and uh, and alcohol. I was doing mathematics. That was my <laughs> my go to. <laughs> uh, uh, it, anyway, serious pleasure out of all of that. It's great. Um, so so here you see now a surprise thing. Okay, this is you see here the icosahedron, and and but then with further folding, so it expands to a cuboctahedron and shrinks into an octahedron. But if you fold it um, by crushing the corners, either crushing the, 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 you know, the triangle corner or crushing the, the slit, that, that's the slit, that's the, the triangle corner, then it becomes a square, becomes a cube, becomes a hypercube in the three dimensions, the model of. This is, um, this has the symmetry of a 12 strat, and this has, um, this has the symmetry of a 60 strat. This is a, actually a chiral dodecahedron, and this is um, um, a regular dodecahedron. And this is a monohedron. That's a whole bunch of mathematical things that I didn't know existed, but I met some guy at Brown who was a meritus professor of math. But it gives you a little taste of uh, what happens here. A lot, that's, that's the reason it's not icosahedral. And also, as you do all these foldings and you look the what happens from here to here, this replicates the same pattern at a smaller scale. So it starts fractalizing. And, um, and by the way, I, I, I hadn't even noticed that. It was one of... Um, um, I don't know if you know the name Dame Dennis Drecher. He was also a guy who did a lot of work for Buckminster Fuller, uh, including inventing the know? jitterbug. Uh, that many people think that uh, uh, the jitterbug was something that Fuller did. Fuller th uh, thought it's possible, but it was Drecher who solved the actual problem. So Fuller was. Uh, yeah, the very, uh, uh, yeah, go ahead. Can, can you? Spell it. Can you spell it for us? Dennis Drecher. Dennis, like short for Dionysus, I believe. Yeah, yeah. Um, Drecher, uh, D R E H E R. Unfortunately, he died. He was a lovely man. I visited him in uh, in Maine. And uh, and uh, anyway, I, I still I still think of him very often. And. Um, and um, what else? We're talking about this. And, and then here, that's a biological thing. This expands and contracts. It's a cowpea uh, a chlorotic model virus. And, um, and this is an engineer in Hungary who found very similar geometry. Now, he made jitterbugs. They move in both directions. But um, not all of his structures are, are jitterbugs. But um, so, um, so he did that uh, for his PhD, modeling um, uh, modeling this this virus. So here he lists all the things that um, this um, shape shifting. By the way, in biology, I don't know if you've heard the term. It's conformation. So the stem cells uh, are, uh, conform conform. It changes form. So that's shape shifting. 
and you yeah. see all the five platonics. Go ahead. You have a question. Uh, no, no. Yes. Uh, right. The, that that there's this uh, shape shifting. That's great. Conformation yeah. according to forces. According to, yeah, I mean, uh, this is, um, uh, one of my collaborators is a virologist. Uh, it's a different story how you get people enticed because they take a big risk of reputation, you know, uh, working with an artist or an architect, you know, basically. Yeah, uh, yeah. So uh, symmetrical to stensegrities, the sixth, 12 and 60. And then um, I, I showed you the square that becomes cubic becomes the tesseract. And then um, um, I, there is also a jitterbug. This is a jitterbug. It, uh, it goes symmetrically in two directions. So the cube, um, it's, it's in, along three axes. It's a, it's, I don't know any jitterbug that does that. That it, maybe but I haven't looked into it. But it is a true jitterbug, this, this here. Great. OK. Then the easy of assembly, uh, that's, you know, uh, the fact that, that you can make, you can make um, form with a membrane through folding is very appealing if you try to convince biologists to take it seriously. And, and, um, and also, as I will show, so I guess that's it. Uh, and by the way, this slide shows you how to do it. You fold it in half, then uh, then you you make these crosses, then you put them over and under, then you get the three squares, and then you start flipping it in. But in order to do that, you have to have pre-creased the joints. You have to give a good massage to loosen it up. Yeah. Otherwise, it um, it doesn't work very well. So here you can see another two of the so they are um, three directions. So two of the three directions have been flipped in, and here uh, here there is one last one, and now this is the voila. You get the elasticity ready to hop around. That's great. But there are people are asking. Some people don't know what a jitterbug is. So maybe you can have is, your definition. Well, the def jitterbug is from named after the dance that you move symmetrically in two directions. And um, Clinton that you mentioned earlier created the first jitterbug with those face connected. Again, he did that for Fuller and Fuller flipped out when he saw it. But uh, a Drecher's jitterbug that was really had an edge connection. Now he made that of paper. It was symmetrical. But when I visited him after a year, the moisture in the paper uh, makes it shrink and makes it chiral. So it had become an, an effective elasticity. In other words, you could yeah. by itself volunteered. I mean, we discovered that together as we were going around his house. And uh, and uh, and then uh, and uh, anyway, uh, I was okay. And we will try to find we'll try to find a link to put in the chat so you can see Fuller doing the jitterbug thing. Yeah, but uh, it has to be a disclosure that he didn't invent it because um, the same thing with uh, with uh, Snelson, he took a picture of Snelson's first integrity. Uh, that uh, Snelson took himself and then he published it as if it was his own. And that was part of the, you know, bad blood between them. But that was not the real reason he was annoyed with him. It was the, the, the fact that after inventing that beautiful word, tensegrity, then he started calling geodesic domes as tensegrities. Even when they have, uh, there are some geodesic domes made with struts and cables but most of them have um, rigid connections and they are not, you know, it confuses the, what it is. That's why he was very sensitive about using words very precisely. Thank you. So another part of the question is that tensegrity exists at all scales, but there's not a clear path. How do you go from the small scale to the big scale? How do you use little tensegrities to build struts and cables? 
Well, the elastegrity uh, allows you, you see, this is the tetrahedron, this is an octahedron, and you can combine them and build at the bigger scale. You can use that as one element. So, so then you can go through all the layers of, the, of the, all the different sizes of scales. And also that explains when you apply a force to ripple through the, all the joints between all the different scales, why you would have hysteresis or, or, or hysteresis is a fancy word, it's Greek, mm -hmm. but it's well understood. It's um, how would you say hysteresis with a colloquial, that it takes time. It takes time to re that's what hysteresis means. Delay. Time, time delay. Time delayed, yes. Why, why the force, it's time delayed to ripple through all the different uh, hinges of, uh, at all the scales to make it all the way to where it starts contracting. Okay, so I'm finishing with this slide um, where you, you see a matrix. So these, these elastegrities, the ones you saw earlier were ABC, were close packed um, along, um, along every third layer. So this is the linear, if you remember the sphere close packing. So uh, this is the model that Inbert created. So Lefteri, this is the AB instead of the ABC, correct? Yeah, this is the AB. Great. So, uh, so in fact, you can see how it gets narrower when it goes down and gets wider when it goes up. And uh, some of the hinges have broken, um, but you can see they kind of rotate and, and, and um, okay. So, but you see here, you see how the diameter of this spring is, uh, is wider than this. The same thing here. Can you tell which spring? So that some of them are compression springs, like in a six strat tensegrity. And some of them are like the cables. The cables are the tensile. So the narrow diameter are pulled. And, and, the, and the wide diameter are, are compressed. So it finds equilibrium through, through, through um, tension and compression in a balance. Uh, so what I propose here is that by varying, by varying the, the, the rigidity of the hinge, uh, you can make a tensile spring. You can make a tensile spring. So this is an elastegrity all shrunk up. Uh, that's another interesting story because the student used ordinary paper and a year later, because of the moisture again, it shrank and became tensile spring. Huh? Uh, and um, and um, so you have to cure it for a year. <laughs> <laughs> like fine wine or cheese. <laughs> right, 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 exactly. That, that was the illusion. And while here, you can see the, the, the hinge is, uh, is uh, bigger than, uh, than 90. Well, here is a lot smaller than 90. So this is in a compression, compression spring, and this is in a tension spring. And, and here I have a little diagram that explains the movement. The movement is surprising. You have seven axes. Actually, that's a good point. I haven't made the whole slide out of it, but I might as well throw that in. Um, you have all these pieces move around a center. The center is not a physical fulcrum, but it's a stable. There are seven axes that go through it and everything. Um, so you have four of these cube corners spiraling um, chirally uh, and the other four anti-chirally. So everything is moving simultaneously going up and down those axes. And the center is empty? The center is empty. But you get the virtual point. Yes, this is the wonderful. virtual uh, fulcrum. Wonderful. Yeah, so that explains how you have stability, and, and at the same time, everything is kind of loose, you know, um, moving around. And uh, and and, the, and now I didn't talk much about um, the slit, the gate. 
the gate closes, of course, when it's at octahedron and closes again when it expands. And at 90 degrees, it becomes, that's when it's a regular icosahedron. But the maximum opening of the gate for some reason, which I don't understand, but it's mathematically correct, it's a little over 77 point something degrees. I'm talking about the dihedral angle. Uh, that's when you achieve the maximum opening. So all these are interesting um, ideas, but you need to talk to somebody who understands biology um, and see if you can make some experiments to bring some of those things, you know, to illuminate each other. And uh, the last slide is, um, so I'm saying that as a, uh, as a question mark. So this is Adam when he's still inorganic his earth, and then uh, God touches him and becomes living. So the question is, is it possible that this, um, this um, uh, elastegrity is um, in its inorganic state and as you flip it inside out, it, uh, it becomes elastic and living and starts jumping around. Okay, so this is my presentation. And I invite you to, to, to build the model and, and experience this uh, from inorganic to organic. Okay, so now we, we have plenty of time for questions. Yeah, that's wonderful. So we can, um, you might want to keep your screen share on for a few minutes in yeah, case- If somebody wants to go back and forth. If you exactly, have in case somebody wants to, um, who ha has a question about a specific slide. And um, it's really wonderful. I love, so so if you can go to the one where the hand is squishing down your elastigrity, one of those. You mean, uh, oh, you mean the- Let's see, before yeah. that, there. Yeah. So the, the elastigrity is going in one direction. And what's happening with the um, jitterbug, which you'll see if you follow the link I put in the chat, is that once you get to that open space, uh, you don't know which direction it's going to go. Could go this way, could go that way. So, um, so it's it's chiral. It can go left or right, but the elasticity is a fixed chirality. Yes. That, that actually, um, there was a guy who looked at the jitterbug and he tried to make metamaterials by 3D printing uh, with silicon. And he made something that's very similar to elastegrity. But he said he could never get it to be jitterbug because of imperfections, it shows a direction and, it, and then it moved chirally. Um, it, although the geometry visually, it, it was symmetrical. Now this question to everybody, if you want to change the chirality to go, how do you build it? So it goes in the other direction. <laughs> and that's a trick you, question. You have to hire someone like me who's left-handed and does everything backwards anyway. Okay, the answer actually was discovered by a student of mine because I had this question and I saw him looking at it very carefully and he realized that if you just flip it upside down, it will start going the other direction. So it's like a screw. If you put the head on the other end, it will go the other direction. Ah, so this is what a tensegrity does as well. Well, a tensegrity, yes, the tensegrity is chiral, but uh, if you squash it down, it will get, you know, the flat uh, sticks. Uh, but um, uh, to get the chirality the opposite direction, you just flip it around. T uh, tensegrity, uh, elastegrity is, uh, has yes. three, yeah. But, but um, a, a tensegrity would do the same. If you put uh, the, the string, a string triangle on your hand and then you push it down on top it will go it will spiral as it condenses either to the left or to the right 
okay? You will feel it in your top hand spiraling. Then if you turn your tensegrity upside down, put the opposite triangle on your hand and you push, you try to push straight down like with the jitterbug, it will then go with the opposite chirality for your upper hand. Yes, exactly correct. So then, so then you have a, um, so I suppose it means really it's a fixed chirality where the top and the bottom are, are turning opposite to each other around that fulcrum of the empty center. Uh, they, yeah, well, it's true. They, because of I know the, fulcrum is a dirty word, right? No, it's not a dirty word. I mean, it's uh, implied fulcrum. It's yes. a good word in steam, but uh, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, when you talk about virtual fulcrum, that's a different story. Yeah. Because you don't have a physical, you don't have any transfer. Of, the transfer of the transfer is on the hinges. Now, the tensegrity does not have cooperative motion uh, because it, it can wobble around because of the nodal connection. Uh, you know, it can go in any direction. Uh, you need so, to guide it um, while the tensegrity, the elastegrity kind of uh, guides itself. Uh, what, did you, what did you call it? Cooperative motion? Yeah, cooperative. In other words, everything moves simultaneously uh, yes. um, at the same time uh, uh, from all directions. So although you pull, there are four directions, right? There are four axes. But if you push it in one direction, then everything will rotate from all four directions at the same time, at the same rate, same angle, same distance from the center. That's but that point. does happen with a, with a tensegrity, doesn't it? Not really, because it opens up. It doesn't stay, uh, it doesn't stay, you know, it, doesn't, it, it flattens. Uh, well, a tensegrity, um, if you follow Fuller and, and Nelson's definition, right, the, the cables are not extensible. If you take the cables and you make them rubber bands, you can make it go flat. Um, but that is not following the, the definitions of Snelson and Fuller, I think. Well, uh it still moves, and that's why uh, Fuller thought that was the ultimate, uh, uh, you know, way of building buildings. But uh, nobody ever built the truth and segregate. Many faked it, and they put some uh, moment. In fact, there was an Israeli who spent ten years studying tensegrity as a structure for architecture, and then he realized by the time you brace it, because it moves so much, it becomes too heavy. Yes. The segregate is great for robots or things that move, but not for static loads. So uh -huh. that relates to what you were saying, because if you make the cable super, super, super tight, it's still not tight. It moves around. Yeah. Yeah. In, in fact, um, um, uh, Steve did a famous experiment. <laughs> uh. Uh, they would arrest him if he tried it these days. He went to Snelson's tensegrity, maybe you know the story, in the middle of the night, <laughs> and he pushed on it. Yes, I've done it, actually. <laughs> oh, you have done it. <laughs> so you, it goes up and down, and, and uh, so it, it, it wants to move, but, you know, it, um, it, it carols around, and uh, it's, not, uh, it's not cooperative. There is, you know, there is... Um, the materials allow it to deviate. So I guess I need to learn more about cooperative and what those constraints are. Um, because I, I, I'm not sure I understand the distinction, but we don't have to spend uh, more time on it now. I can look into it. Um, and and uh, Graham is talking about how the motion in the tensegrity is much more limited than the elastegrity. The elastegrity has a stability at all its different points, right? All the way to closed and all the way to open. Would you agree? Yeah, the tensegrity has, uh, that's what cooperative motion is. 
the elastegrity actually, uh, what's his name? Uh, Ingber made a model of the elastegrity um, kind of wobbling around when you put force uh, on it. So it has a lot more freedom, obviously, because mathematically a node can go in many different directions while the hinge is a constraint. Okay, that, so way you, you the just language, said- By the way, that's the exact language that uh, Ingber used. Yeah, so let me make sure I heard you correctly. Did you say Ingber made an elastegrity or a tensegrity? Well, he called it tensegrity, but he introduced a hinge. Ah. The model I showed you. So he I kept the word. And also it's a little cryptic where the hinges are. He talks verbally, but he doesn't show the diagram, how it, the hinge actually... And he did it in order to focus the energy, these are his words, and to limit the motion. So he inadvertently made an elastegrity. Well, he, he, when he put those uh, springs together, that's his model. Yeah. That's an elastegrity too, a lin with linear elements. It's a little bit like that sculptor, Arnie, what was his name? Martin. Arnie Martin, uh, he made a bunch of um, tensegrities with the wire, piano wire, and therefore he named them elastegrities because, ah, because okay. they, they resist compression. I don't know his work. That's wonderful. I love hearing new and names. Unfortunately, he stopped doing them. It, that's his early work when he was still a student. And he no longer puts the, they, they, I, I think there's some tensegrity sites that has Arnie Martin's sculptures, but he stopped working with it. You know, um, he, he went in other, he, uh, I tried to establish collaboration with him, but the same way the scientists feel defensive about working with, with uh, artists, turns out the artists are not different. <laughs> they, <laughs> they feel their art will be compromised. Uh, we have a question about if you would talk more about um, how you create the crystal lattice models. Do you connect the cells using the flaps of paper? Uh, do you use string? Do you use adhesives? No, actually, the, you mean the crystals, not the elastegrity. Correct. The crystal lattice okay. models. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So this is one of them. So these, uh, I don't have all the pictures here. Uh, but, uh, but each one of those is an element with the, you see the, the little cube here? So the little cube, you squeeze it and pops inside. So that's how you connect them. Is that clear or so? Chris, Chris, does that make sense to you? No, I think I would have to see a video of it being created. Yeah, or I have this other slides. From the, from the um, octahedron or the diamond, you called it, I think. Uh, yeah, the, okay. Uh, you st you're right. I skipped a step. The, the, the octahedron, where is it? Uh, is it here? Oh, I didn't put it in. Oh, uh, no, I didn't put it in. Okay, this is, this is a bunch of them. These are taped together. Yes. We use tape. Right here, I give, but if you take the corner of the of the corner of the octahedron, mm -hmm. you can uh, s s slide it and insert it in its other, and then you get this is one of those mm. with a stubby corner, and actually you can make it if you try to do it with a six piece of paper, it will get too imprecise. But it, it, there's a way of doing that with one. If you email me, I will send you the pattern for making this. Okay, thank you. And, and, and then once you have that, then you, you have four core, you see the four cubes with a little opening? Yes. Well, then you insert one cube inside the other. Uh -huh. Then okay. you can grow the cube, you can grow and make a big, a, a big giant uh, crystal. And, and this you, orange one yeah. uh, is, a number of separate papers put together using the little flap or? Uh, there is a way to build this out of one paper. Oh, there is, okay. Sorry, you may have said that before, I just didn't. And, and you get a higher precision. I mean, in theory, you can just take this, made with six pieces of paper, 
yeah. uh, cut the corners, fold them, insert it. That's how I first found it. But, um, uh, but then I discovered you can actually do it. It's actually very beautiful. It's a square piece of paper and you get little crosses. There. And that was the pattern of slits. Mm -hmm. and it folds on itself. And then you can use those units. And, and actually I have a, a, I had the students who did a big, a, a big model. And if you look at the diamond under a microscope, mm -hmm. it looks identical to the model they did uh, in, in the physical, you know, with the paper. Wonderful. So that's the, one, that's the one way. The other way, this is, this is with the, this is made with two squares. Now, mm -hmm. if you take this and you squeeze it into a pyramid, mm -hmm. then, then these, these, these guys become, become these guys that they insert in each other. So that's another way of mm -hmm. connecting them. So you, you don't need to use glue or anything like that. I think we can maybe take um, the patterns and Chris, isn't, don't we have a way to put a link for next week's newsletter um, so that people can link to these things? And all yes. do the same thing, please. I haven't published any of that. You can- Oh, I mean the, the pattern for the octahedron, is that not published? No, no, the octahedron, uh, the, with the one paper, no. But the six, as I said, many different people found that. Yes. So this one, um, ideally they should be emailing and say, I got possession of that and I don't plan to, uh, is that and totally open? Anybody can go there? Can go uh, where? No, it would be for, I'm talking about, but I'm posting something of, for our mailing list. Yeah, the mailing list, yes. We can tell them to please um, use it and, uh, and um, recognize it has not been published. Yes. I, I believe that in our newsletter, it gave your email address as you instructed so that people could relate, could interact with you directly. Well, maybe that's the best way. Yes, it's, yes. It's, then they can send. Then, like I have a package. I used to do that with wind energy. I had the packets, whoever, uh, whoever emailed me, they got the packets. You know, uh, let there is, I want to uh, just jump for just a second to, um, and there are more questions, but you have done work with wind energy, uh, promoting wind energy so that we can get off of fossil fuels. And I know that in Providence and in <laughs> New England, there's a lot of wind because I grew up there. And um, my, my hometown is sometimes recorded as one of the windiest cities in the United States. Um, but, but the other thing is you have collaborated with one of my longtime heroes, uh, Galen Krantz, who wrote the book, The Chair, which is a fabulous book. And I wonder if you could just talk a little about your work together. Well, she's a sociologist studying how people experience buildings. Uh, and when she was writing her book, she sent me a galley. And, and uh, when I was reading it, uh, I found the word tensegrity. Um, so that was 10 years after I had built the elastegrity. And because it had similar symmetry, that's when I started calling it tensegrity. Uh, so if we've been meeting at the Environmental Design Research Association uh, conference, and um, we put her syllabus and my syllabus and we made a common reading list and we, and, and we made this as a reader. And uh, so we, we have done quite a few presentations together and a few publications together on, 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 on the unrelated issue of how people experience buildings. That's because wonderful. And what she does best is her Alexander technique, which um, because of that, she, she, um, she understands the world dactylognostically. Um, so she, she's also an Alexander teacher? Well, yeah, 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 a very uh, high level. Oh. And, and actually uh, she was gonna die young because of severe scoliosis and in her- um, Wow attempt of saving her life, she discovered Alexander and, and, um, and not only did she save her life, but it led to, uh, to the book 
which made her full professor because that book became uh, very widely read in many different disciplines. And, and you mean the, the book on the chair? Yeah. Yeah, that's so, wonderful. Yeah, medi uh, so in, in Iceland, uh, they wanted to inaugurate a university or have some big deal. So they wanted somebody that was known in many different fields. So Galen's name came from many different disciplines. So they ended up inviting her because of that. That's great. And, um, uh, maybe what we should do, because um, oh, By Jenny... the way, she reversed, that's important. She has the pictures to show that she reversed scoliosis. The scoliosis. She has the x-rays to show it got less. It's great. They're not and enough years to go all the way back. Maybe but, somebody uh, could put a link to, um, so it's, it's Galen, C-R-A-N-T-Z, right? And um, you can look for the book, The Chair. Maybe somebody could put the link, could put that link in the chat. Yeah, and the other thing is- book. It's a great book, by the way. Yes, it's fabulous. And, and, and I'm thinking, Lefteri, maybe you could stop your screen share. Uh, what we do in this kind of second part of the, um, of the show here is everybody who wants to can turn their cameras on. And then um, we've got a couple of questions that maybe people themselves want to ask. And I know Jenny uh, Sterling, I think you're in Boston still, and you were one of the people who, who asked for the um, pattern. Um, and maybe you want to ask your own question here. Go ahead. Well, hi, actually, you know, I'm not going to ask any questions, but I just find this so fascinating because some of you know, I'm just complete novice in all of this stuff. I understand so little of what I hear, yet I want to cry because I find it so beautiful. And I, I just made, I didn't have the time, um, but I made this, the beginning of this model and just feeling it. It's an extraordinary experience, I have to say. It's, hey, it's, hey, it's, I can no, relate to that, yeah. It doesn't feel flat or dimensional. I folded it very carefully, following your instructions. And it's just such a beautiful sensation and you get the feeling. In fact, um, I teach violin and viola and I could sort of feel some of the the ways that this paper is moving is actually a way to inform you know movement and uh anyway so thank you that's all i want to say but i'm going to make let, the let me say something about music i was thinking how music connects and then i i, I go to an alexander technique um, uh, um, teacher and she also uh, is the teacher for trinity uh, theater and and they do for voice and um, the alexander technique yes. I don't know if you're familiar with that. So, um, so, so it, um, uh, so she, uh, she was very, I gave her one of those and eventually it becomes like that, but you need to cut the slits. That's the next step. Well, I try, I, my scissors were too primitive. I need, because I didn't, I don't have a capacity. You don't want to ruin it. Yes, you did with so much care. <laughs> anyway, she, she uses that in her lessons. Uh, to explain um, the Alexander, how it works. So there are many people- So I think wonderful. Here. Yes, Diane has one over there. Sorry, sorry, go. So there are many people- Jenny, go ahead, sorry. There are just many people in the music world and, um, and Kimi is here, who's a physical therapist who are now applying these principles of Alexander technique and everything you're talking about, but it's just beautiful to see how it's also um, connected. Thank you, that's all. Thank you. <laughs> It's wonderful. And um, Patricia, did you want to ask uh, your question? Sure. I'm going to leave my video off because my internet's a little unstable. Um, so sure. I was just looking at the words hinge elastegrity, if I got that right, on the screen. And um, like Jenny, I'm in awe, but also a lot of it is going over my head. So um, I just was wondering if you can speak to the use of the word hinge there. Is it the general usage definition or does the word hinge have some kind of technical definition in this no, no, no. context? It's, it's, it's just a piece of paper. Uh, I don't know. Can you see here? I cannot see my screen. Am yes. I? Yes. Yes. Let me just spotlight you. Hang on. Okay, great. Okay. Okay. So, so, so the, um, this is the hinge. Um, this is a hinge along here. 
So this is thanks for the... that to explain. So this is a corner of the cube. This is rigid. And this, this here, this is a this is the hinge, and it has one hinge in the middle, and then a hinge between. So this is a hinge system. So it floats. There are twelve of these, and the corners, eight corners of the cube are floating, on these um, on these uh, hinge systems. And hinge systems have one hinge in the middle, and then one between the corner of the cube on this side and the corner of the cube on the other side. Is that more clear? Yes. So there's an external yes. hinge, an external hinge, which is that outer edge and an internal hinge into the, it's funny for your head, right? Because it's a triangle, but the corner of a cube is a triangle or a um, sort of a. It's a tetrahedron. But it's a tetrahedron, a, yes. Yes, for a, but it's rigid. Yes. But then it's floating on this. So th if you take a piece of paper and crease it, that crease, I call it hinge. Yes. Because it, it moves. A crease, yeah. that's crease. good. Right, so the word hinge is to distinguish the, um, the creases that move from the creases that are rigid, that stay rigid. Yes, they, what moves, what allows it to move, it's like, you know, I thought of it as the door hinge. In fact, I have students who made a, 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 the elastigrity with triangles of cardboard, and then they activated the hinges with little springs. <laughs> And yeah. my dream is to make one 10, 10 feet diameter. And, and then, uh, and then, um, and then it will be, you know, a, a, like a public monument. Yeah, <laughs> that's great. A moving monument. A moving yeah. monument. Yes. And there are a few ways to actuate it, but along one axis. You can pull it with a string. You can put a string from corner to corner. Um, Carol Boggs, maybe you want to unmute and uh, because I know you're another person who I think has been working with this. You've been working with these elastegrity models for many years, right? Yes. Well, I, I have made one. <laughs> um, and so the hinge is the fold. Is that correct to say yeah. that? Yeah, yeah. The fold. That's yeah. another word. It's a serum. And what is the material of the yellow model that you've been demonstrating with? That's acetate. Acetate. Uh -huh. And 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 the, um, if you have access to laser uh, laser cutting, uh -huh. you can set it so it scores it without cutting it. Mm -hmm. Ah. So um, um, the one in the mail for the organizers is uh, the same thing as this yellow one. Um, <laughs> so the the um, yeah. So if you want, I even have the. But it's very easy to make the, once you have the file. If anybody who does laser cutting, uh, we often do it from scratch. It's very easy to do it. So I don't know even if you need the the. You do it in um, uh, AutoCAD. Uh, and you import it in the laser laser cutter. Right. Yeah, I had a student who invented this scoring, slight scoring, and then you get uh, with more precision. You can do things you couldn't do just um, with your hands. Uh, mm -hmm. So they do the laser cutting, and instead of cutting all the way through, they just score with the laser cut. Yeah, they cut through the perimeter and through the slits. And then they score all the other lines. Oh, that's great! And also, uh, they 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 started writing the Pavlidis elastegrity in the email uh, <laughs> by by the laser cutting. Oh, <laughs> that's great! Do you do you sell these pre-scored, pre-cut? Actually, um, I wanted to start doing that. Um, um, so uh, that I was hoping um, if you give me feedback about the instructions, 
I think I'm ready to go and start selling them. Uh, and, and I want to sell them like Hoberman did and, and Rubik, uh, not so much for the m money, but to make sure that they, uh, given the experience uh, of, uh, of uh, things from the arts that have been appropriated with no credit, uh, right. it's, it's a way of, uh, of uh, you know, uh, of owning it. And, and getting the dactylnosis dactylinosis out into all the different millions of fingers around the world, right? How wonderful idea. And, and I, I really appreciate because I was really hoping that I thought it was a cool word. I tried it on a few people and, and Susan, you took, you know, the idea that somebody else will use it, it delights me. I, I, yeah, I wished I had it before I wrote my book because it's what I talk about learning through the fingers and why you have to build these models. Um, another there, I want to ask you. Yeah. Uh, go ahead, go ahead. No, I, that's another connection with music, because when you play the piano and the viola and, and you paint, a, a lot of the decisions are made um, in a tactile way. And, and then you integrate with your thinking and with um, their feedback loops. But a lot of the innovations are from the fingers and sometimes the finger gone their own way. <laughs> this is great. You're backing up our um, closed kinematic chain paper, I think, when you say that. Um, I want to ask because um, uh, Doug Johnson is here and he, um, he's another musician who uh, has been looking at all of this. And I don't know if you're familiar with the work of um, Bob Connolly and Alan Back and their work on uh, the concept of superstability in mathematically modeled tensegrities. Uh, but we've Connolly. been looking at. I, sorry, say I, again? I have met Connolly in a math conference, the guy from Cornell. Yes, yes, lovely guy. Yes, actually, I had the lunch with him because he's good friends with my mathematician collaborator. I was trying to get him interested to do the mathematics similar that he did for tensegrity to elastegrity. Um, but uh, he didn't, I might see him, there's a conference every two years uh, in Atlanta, the gathering for Gardner, which was the legendary editor for American scientific, I don't know, in some areas is ah. a major figure. Great. Uh, um, but, uh, um, anyway, so you, what did you say about so, him? So Connolly and Back wrote a paper uh, about, um, they've written about tensegrities and Bob has written probably uh, the most about this concept of super stability that tensegrities in terms of mathematics, that, that the configuration and, and uh, Robert Skelton has also um, discussed this, that the configuration can sort of at least theoretically endlessly change with out loss of stability and with minimal energy. And so the question, and maybe Doug, you wanna ask yourself, has to do with how that may relate to what we're seeing with the elastegrity. But Doug is here and Doug and Jenny are both near you, um, Lefteri, they're both in Boston. Okay. Yeah, the question is actually quite general. I mean, this, this, the uh, concept of super, super stability has been uh, becoming more central in understanding tensegrity and biotensegrity. And I would appreciate it with your architectural background if you could just share your thoughts and maybe a, a definition for us about these concepts. I, ha I have to read about it. I don't know the term super stability. I can start imagining, but I don't really know. And, and that's why I was hoping... Uh, now, it turns out I can take anything and unpack it, but it takes forever. <laughs> so I presume I could take Connolly's papers and try to crawl through them. Um, also, Skelton, and, 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 and there's another guy, Cornell. Uh, what's his name? Not, uh, yes, Sultan. Sultan. Uh, he's a collaborator with Skelton. They did a, a paper on tensegrities as, um, as uh, sensors because of the way the signal travels through the, through the hinges, the, the, the pre-stress. 
Yes. And, and that was one of the uh, things I said to NASA. Well, if tensegrity can be a sensor, maybe they can be an elastegrity sensor. And they want to make um, analog sensors for Venus because it's 700 degrees, the electronics don't work. So they need to find um, sensors like a tensegrity or an elastegrity that is um, mechanical. More so, mechanical. Yeah, That's so great. I, uh, I haven't gone any further. So yeah. can you explain actually, that's an opportunity. What's a definition of super stability? Uh, well, it's the idea that um, I, I'm going to botch it, I'm sure, but it's the idea that the configuration, the specifics of the physical configuration can endlessly change. Okay, so there can be endless reconfigurability without any loss at any moment of stability. Would you agree, Graham? Yes, yes. As a layman, I'll go along with that. Yes. Well, so, um, in some way, so the, the, virtual, the virtual fulcrum might relate to this idea that everything can move, but there are some stable places in the whole configuration. I don't know if that relates. Yes, I think that makes sense, the kind of quiet center. Um, Just uh, Chris, you're trying to say something, and I know Bruce has a question, and I was going to see. I have been trying to jump in and let you know that not Bruce has a question, but also we've got a question coming to you from YouTube. Do you want me to read it out? Well, I think Bruce's came first, though, didn't it? Yeah, I'm not sure. I if just I'm looking at the chat. Over to, yeah. Go for it. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, I'm looking in the in the order. I'm trying to go in the order I have them in the chat, so I don't. Okay, I asked Bruce to turn his camera on and unmute, but he hasn't done that. I will ask again. Okay, but then while he's doing that, why don't you go ahead with the YouTube question? Okay, and this is from Susan Kuhn, maybe at the last name. Thinking of this model in relation to the heart muscle, could the hinges represent the fascia adherence in the gap junc junctions between cardiomyocytes? Uh, actually, I was thinking of the same thing, but I don't have enough biology uh, but um, I was looking at the heart. Um, the the elastegrity is much more primitive because the heart has, you know, it's more complicated with two chambers. Um, but definitely the heart uh, contracts with a spiral motion. Now, as I'm saying this, there's another thing that I didn't saw for some reason. Maybe I should try to get a screen. The, wh when I do that, do you, you know, want yeah. us to spotlight you for this? Oh, yeah. But hold on. There we go. Yeah. So the vertices, there are 12 vertices, right? When Because um, an icosahedron and also a cuboctahedron have 12 vertices. So when I press that, the vertices make an ellipse. It's a very precise. So there are 12 ellipses. The, that path, the path which they traveled so that th when they converge upon each other. They converge to the corners of the octahedron. Yes. So, <coughs> they, they, and, a, a two, and of course they come together because the octahedron has six. Yes. The cube octahedron has 12. Yes. So those ellipses um, may have something to do with some of the things that are biological because there's some recent paper looking at, uh, now these are ideas, I have no idea what they mean, but in mathematics, they talk about turbulent systems mm -hmm. where the ellipses became important. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm just throwing it out there. These That's are a bunch of words that may connect. I love it. Is, uh, is Bruce there? I'm sorry. So, no, no, that's good. So did I answer the question? What was the question? I think. Oh, the heart. Because it was from YouTube, so so it's not somebody who's here on Zoom. And uh, it was a question about there? the heart. It was a question about the heart. Right, right, right. Did we address that? Yes, that's what we just addressed. Yeah, that they. Uh, yeah. yeah, I think. Yeah, the fascia, absolutely. The 
um, you know how you know how the hinge, the concept of the fold, translate in biological because of course you don't have a straight line biological. You can you have, um, but still there is a kind of a hinging. So um, Bruce may be gone, but I'm going to ask his question. Um, are there different? Uh, you talked a little about the fractality, which was so interesting. He Bruce is asking, are there different nesting? properties and parameters, um, he says, related to elastegrity versus tensegrity. So I'm not sure what the versus is about, but maybe you can talk about the fractality and the nested the, what, similarity. What, 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 um, the nesting, I don't understand what the nesting word might be. Nested mean. self similarity. So it's a fractality, so a small okay, yeah, one yeah. Oh, fractality. and a bigger one and a bigger one and a bigger one, like well, a well, I don't have, uh, like right, right. Sierpinski's right, triangle right. and Koch. I didn't hear the, the word fractality. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah. But yes, well, I know, uh, I know in elastegrity through folding, the folds uh, replicate a different, uh, at a smaller and smaller scale, at least for a couple of steps. Uh, so I know how fractals appear there. Uh, I, I'm, I'm not knowledgeable enough of the if uh, what fractal could mean in tensegrity. Mm -hmm. In other words, what are the scales that they replicate? Uh, yeah, no. For for modeling biology, what we do is we envision um, in the tensegrity that um, this every strut, every string could be a tensegrity mast. You see. So we envisioned that for, right. for, for biology, there would be this fractality and also this um, soft matter transmutability right. and the ability now, for spots and strings to flip. Mm -hmm. Now you have a, a one more model to consider and that yes, is great. A, linear, a linear arrangement of, uh, of uh, elastegrities uh, creating, uh, creating the cable as well as the strut by varying the, the stiffness of what I refer to as the hinge or the fold. Yes. So the fold is, um, remember the paper? Yes, yeah. <laughs> Wasn't that wonderful? <laughs> A year <laughs> later, it, it's like perfect. You know, it's, it's pure tension. Um, Chris I've, got a, I've got an image here of Graham's fractal six strut, if you would like me to share yeah, it. I would very much like that. That would be great. Yeah, we would love to see that. and and. Um, Gerald de Jong made a, a, a fractalized one that you can see also uh, on the studio tour. Look at that. So I guess that's a little bit like what uh, what uh, how you call it Ingber did for his uh, for his model, the one that jiggled around. It's uh, starting to look more like that, isn't it? Yeah, but. So the red uh, is, uh, so some of them are more uh, read, so more compression and more uh, others more tensile. Yes, the red, the red ones are the compression straps, so they're under compression. Right, right. Uh, oh, that's interesting. So then there's a parallel between uh, what I'm proposing with the elastegrities. Yes, yes. That's great, more, more territory. I, so, I, but I how do you connect the corner? Is there a specific geometry to the corner? It's the same. Each node has got four cables coming off it, but each cable is made from. So naturally, it, it uh, they come together. Yes, yeah, that's right. Yeah. You just have to figure the chirality. I bet it's complicated figuring the chirality. The chirality yeah, yeah. is self self emerges, doesn't it, Graham? No, it depends on how the different tensegrity model, six strut modules are put together. So you can have wider chirality. I see, I see. I, I have to use different color to keep them straight. But after you learn it, you can go with it. But uh, in the beginning, it's uh, it's mind numbing to, to coordinate the chirality. Yes. The, the chirality, when you look at the six strut as two, three struts of opposing chirality together. So the, the triangles on the the six strut. Yeah. Each triangle has got a left or right-handed right. configuration of struts coming out of it. Right. And to join them together, you need a left-handed with a right-handed. Otherwise, it gets all 
messed up. I see. Yeah. yeah. Then, um, yes, yeah. go ahead. It's Sorry. I'm very... No, I mean, in real life, that's when you get um, cancer or something like that. <laughs> in other words, it's a pathology when they, when they don't come together. Or you get the mutant, uh, mutant fetus or something. I remember going to my daughter's college chemistry class with her when I was visiting her years ago. And the teacher was talking about how a right-handed sugar, you know, is sugar. You take exactly the same materials and you make a left-handed sugar and it will kill you. So chirality <laughs> is important. Um, I was gonna see if um, Barbara Rosa Milla, I think you may have been, did you ask, did you try to make a model as well? Did you want to unmute? Are you still here? Did you want to put your camera on? She may not be in hearing distance. That's the reason I quit teaching. You didn't know. <laughs> And so, yeah, this idea of the, um, the helical movement, right? And the curves and the ellipsis that you were talking about as the pathway through space of the vertices, all of this is emerging from things that have straight lines. And I think that's a, um, a sort of, um, a concept of the emergence of the curb from the from the straight lines of push and pull when we're looking at tensegrities or in the elastegrity, you're seeing the same thing. You're seeing this this uh, curving and spiraling movement, right? The rising from relationships of straight lines. Yeah, it's too bad I didn't have the model that uh, showed that the ellipses, but and it was exactly that the straight lines, but. Uh, for the longest time, I thought it spirals through space. And Clinton kept saying ellipses, ellipses. And I didn't know what he was talking about. And then I, I need to go back to him because then I had this high power mathematician visiting Brown for a year. And uh, we were able to, to model it and, and, and really slowed it down and, and, and really understand it. And that's when we found the cylinders and you get the conic, I mean, the, the section through the cylinder and you get the quarter of the ellipse, you That's know, great. beautifully all moving together and everything. We're, we're getting near the end of our live time on YouTube. Um, Barbara, I see you don't have a camera. Did you want to speak? Not particularly. I'm, um, I'm fascinated and confused. So that's, call me that, completely waiting to get my hands on an acetate model. Oh, that's wonderful. That's great. It's a kind of, um, <laughs> that delightful state of, of confusion as uh, but, but Ada Lovelace if, wrote about. If you have, us, if you have laser cutting, um, yeah, that's good. But a, a, a paper, a drawing paper, uh, that's heavier than um, it's uh, it's really um, just as good or even better that's and, going to be my afternoon project <laughs> <laughs> that's great and um i'm going to tell you left there that craig nevin is on youtube and he's another uh person i think who wrote to you and is yes, uh, yes. working on the model so he's uh, listening from youtube yes. um and he says there's a mathematical theorem that recognizes the elliptical motion, uh, elliptical motion can predict oxetic structures. Yeah, obviously I want a copy of this and I would love to meet him. I mean, if we can, uh, if we can zoom um, together. Great. Uh, and so, and um, yeah, great, I, I got a new that, I would be happy to set that up. That's great. Yeah, I, I mean, I have my own uh, my own Zoom. Okay, great. Yeah, yeah, very often he's he's live with us um, here on Zoom, but today he's on YouTube. Yes, hi, Craig. If you can hear me, that's great. Okay, so I think we're going to uh, 
Chris, are we going to wind up? You're muted, Chris. Why don't we invite Kimmy to ask her question? Oh, I didn't realize Kimmy had a question. Or Kimmy, if it's a model making question, maybe we'll shut off the YouTube live first. Kimmy, you're Looks muted. Like model making. Uh, hold on. Is Kimmy able to unmute? There we go. Up. Oh. There we go. It is a model making question. So if you want to uh, close the YouTube first, that's fine. Okay. Oh, yeah. Maybe, yeah, I can go get some paper. Okay, <laughs> that's great. And uh, um, any, so any other question? We're going to, we're going to, so before we uh, go off of YouTube, uh, we're going to thank our sponsors once again, and we're going to have a goodbye toast from Lefteri. So, um, Graham, are you going to give a thank you to the sponsors? Yes, I can. I'll make a quick run through. Our Biotensegrity Party is an all volunteer production of the Stephen M. Levin Biotensegrity Archive and made possible through the generous support of our sponsors. And we have Handspring Publishing, Embodied Biotensegrity, Artifact Pro, Integrated Biotensegrity, Matrix Repatterning, Python Security Congress coming from Brazil, the Fascia Hub, Pretense doing Holland, and that's it for a quick run through. And you can look in All the right. chat for more details. Can I put a plug in for the Congress? I know that there is a discount code that is yes. active until the thing. end of the month. Yeah, through the 31st. So, yep. And also, if you're listening on YouTube and you're wondering how to get in on the Zoom meetings, you need to go to biotensegrityarchive.org and get on our email list. Okay, do we have anything else, Chris, Graham, before we have our closing toast? Next week or do we? Uh, yes, next week we have George Roth. George, you wanna quickly say hi? There you go. Yes, thank you. Um, hello, it's a pleasure listening to you. I just love the uh, the depth in which you explore these things, Eleftherios. I hope I pronounced that correctly. And um, anyways, so I find it fascinating. And so I look forward to seeing everyone uh, next week who's available and hope to uh, uh, share with you some of my exploration of how biotransegrity relates to some of the therapies that I've been investigating for the past 30 odd years since I met Stephen Levin back in Toronto. And uh, wow. so I, I'm, I'm excited to share that with you. That Thanks, George. George. All right, over to Lefteri for the closing toast. Thank you. Well, uh, just to finish the Uzo. <laughs> <laughs> Just joking, of course. That's the toast. Finish your ooze, all right? <laughs> <laughs> okay, shall we say goodbye to our YouTube?